Hello again. I'm glad to be back with you and I'd like to do a problem for you today on how to calculate strain in a tapered bar. I kind of like this one. I know that's kind of a nerdy thing to like, but I like this one. I'm, I'm happy to show this one to you. Let's say we've got a, a constant cross-section bar. We'll talk about a tapered bar in a second. But let's say it's constant cross-section and I've got a length at, or a force F, a length L, okay? Now it's fixed up at this end, so it's welded on, clamped on, set in concrete. Somehow this end isn't moving, and this end is free to move. And I want to find the change in length at this end. Well, I'm going to assume this thing is round, kind of trying to make it easy. There's, there's an awful lot of round bars in the world, so that's not bad. And that's going to be A. Well, let's see. I have to know how stiff the material is, so I need to know the elastic modulus. Because remember, the elastic modulus is the number that tells you the stiffness of a, a part due to its material. Okay? Every material has a different elastic modulus. Well, the, the expression that we probably know, if you don't, you can go look this up. All right? It's pretty easy to derive. I think I might have done this in a previous video. If not, remind me and I'll do it. Um, the, so this, the change in length is FL over AE. Right? This is easy to figure out and this works for constant cross-section bars. Well, what if we change this and I'm going to leave everything the same except now I'm going to make the bar tapered. So I've got the, the uh, center line doesn't change. And there we go. Let's say it's tapered like that. Okay, constant taper. Now it doesn't really matter what kind of taper I use. Once I work the method out, I can use any kind of taper I want. Um, so, but right for right now, I make it easy. Let's say it's constantly tapering, and I have a diameter up here I'll call D1, and a diameter down there I'll call D2. And A, that's now A of X, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say X goes down that way. But the A, the, the cross-section layer, it depends on where I am in the bar. Okay. Well, before we had delta L equals F L over A E. Hmm. Okay, that only works for a constant cross section. What if I approximate this bar by a bunch of constant cross section segments and add those up? Well, that ought to work. Okay, so let's try that. I'm going to move that out of the way. If I do this, let's see, maybe I could. There's one constant segment. Here's another one. Let's see if I can get this over here. Okay, so I've got three constant cross-section segments, and I can analyze every one of these using that FL over AE expression. So I've got A1, L1, A2, L2, and A3, L3. Okay. So how am I going to figure out the displacement down here out of those sections? Well, let's just add them up. So let's see, my delta L is going to be, we'll see, F and E don't change, right? But L and A do, F, L over A, E, so A1, L1, plus L2 over A2, plus L3 over A3. Well, that's the displacement from each of the segments added up, and that's going to give me the, the right answer for this, and that's approximately the answer to that. Well, how would I make that more accurate? The easy thing to do would be to use more segments. And so instead of three, maybe I could have six. And I would, I would, my approximation would be getting closer and closer to the ideal. Okay. If we're using more and more and more segments and adding them up, that starts to sound an awful lot like an integral, doesn't it? That's all an integral is, is adding up a bunch of segments. Well, let's just go ahead and do that. Rather than all these things, writing them out as a series, let's write this out as an integral. So I'm going to do this. See, that's, that's my approximation. Or, let's see if I can put this down here. You guys are going to be able to see this. The exact answer, or the exact expression, I should say, Okay, 1 over A, there's the exact expression now. So what I've done is F and E are constant. Those really don't change. No matter where I cut this, I'm going to find out that force F is still acting. So if I put a fictitious cut anywhere, 
of course the reaction force still has to be F, so that's constant. I'm going to assume for right now this is made out of a kind of a, the same material everywhere. That seems like a pretty good assumption. So E is the same for everything. The only thing that changes is A, and this is really A of X. All right? So we're going to have this integral. Now I have to erase this on my little board, so I'm going to put this up here for a reference. Remember, this is, don't let this scare you. This is just a fancy way of adding, pretty much. Okay? Now, a mathematician is going to think about this different than an engineer is. But for us engineers and engineering technologists, that's just a fancy way of adding. So let's see, I'm going to get rid of that. And I don't need this anymore. So all i got to do now is if I can define A as a function of X, I'm good to go. Well, let's start with diameter. And I need some numbers here. So let's say D1 equals 0 0.010 meters. So that's 10 millimeters. And I'm going to make it 5 millimeters down there. So D2 is, is uh, let's see, let's make it 10 millimeters. 0 0.005 meters. That's 5 millimeters. And the length, I'm going to, I'm going to, going to cop out here. The length is just going to be 1 meter. Okay? So that's a long skinny bar, which is, that's, that's reasonable. So my diameter as a function of x is going to be 0 0.010 minus 0.010. Okay, there. There you go. If x is 1, then I'm going to have 5 millimeters. If x is 0, I'm going to have 10 millimeters. So I know that's good. And then my area of x is going to be pi over 4 d of x squared. Now I know we always learned uh, uh, area of a circle is pi r squared, and that's certainly correct. But if it's pi r squared, radius is half the diameter, so it's pi times the diameter squared over 4. I find this is you know, a little bit easier to work with. So my length is going to be f over e. Now I'm going to need an f and an e. So let's make this. Uh, I think I made this in my example here, 10,000 newtons. Oops. Ten thousand newtons, and I need a material. Well, let's make it out of what did I use here? Aluminum, I think. Yeah, aluminum. Let's make E seventy times ten to the ninth pascals. And pascal is just a newton per meter squared, so we're good there. Now I'm going to do everything in terms of meters. If I go to the, the, the most fundamental units, I find out I mess up a lot less often. Okay. Um, it's tempting to think that professors don't mess up, believe me. We mess up as much as anybody else. It's just we tend to do it in private and, and, and fix it before we get to class, mostly. All right, so there's 0 to 1. So it's 1 over a squared. So it's 1 over that squared, 0 0.010 minus 0 0.005x squared dx, okay? Let's put some numbers in there, actually. That's 10,000, and that's 70 times 10 to the ninth. So there we go. Now we've gone from approximating everything as a, as a uh, or approximating the effect of the tapering as a bunch of discrete, constant cross-section segments to actually accounting for the fact that it's tapering okay, directly. And this is basically adding up an infinite number infinite number of constant cross-section segments, okay? But that's, that's what integrals are. So if you work this out, you get delta L equals, and I'm going to cheat here and pull this off, is uh, 3.638 times 10 to the minus 3 meters, okay? Well, that's just 3.638 millimeters. Okay, does this make sense? I mean, could that be the right answer? I always tell my students, always give your answers the sniff test. Whenever you calculate a number, just stand back and take a look and say, could that be the right answer? You know, because if you're the, the one person in the room who's able to find a mistake and be able to say, look, that's not the right answer. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the right answer is, but I know it's not that. that if you're the one person in the room that can do that, you're the automatically the most valuable person in the room. That's good. Okay, so could that be the right answer? Well, how could we check? Now, let's see. 
What if I calculated using FL over AE, the constant cross-section expression? What if I tried uh, you, uh, calculating the displacement for a bar that was 10 millimeters in diameter and also the displacement for one that was 5 millimeters in diameter? Okay, 10 millimeter diameter, the displacement for a 10 millimeter diameter bar should be less than that and for a 5 millimeter diameter bar it should be more than that, right? Well, let's try it. I did it here. And I'll write this down so that uh, you can have the, everything on the board at once here. For constant area D equals 10 millimeters, delta L equals, let's see, 1.819 millimeters. Okay? Constant. A, D equals 5 millimeters. Okay, that is indeed less than that. That's good. One more check. Let's make sure this is more than that and we'll have some confidence in our answer. That turns out to be uh, delta L equals 7.276 millimeters. Okay, so there you go. That's a pretty good indication that that's a believable answer. It's halfway between there and there. So there you go. We've started out by modeling our tapered bar by a series of constant cross-section segments and then said, well, what if the constant cross-section segments are very, very, very small and I add up a whole bunch of them, developed an integral, solved that, got this answer, and then did a check to show that this is in between these two extremes, these two possible extremes. So there you go. Hope this helps, and I'll see you next time.